Thank you for joining us for this week's episode of Refresh, our online Bible study. We are currently uh, on our way through the Ten Commandments, taking a look at how such an old document, an Old Testament document, what all the law was based on, applies to those of us who live now in the New Testament age, in the age of grace, in the kingdom of Christ. How do they apply to us today, and what can we learn from them, and what do we learn about God through all of them? Today, we're going to look at the sixth commandment, you shall not murder. I know what most of you are thinking when you hear that. Well, okay, I really can just go ahead and stop this one. I don't need to watch it. But let me ask you to hang around because we're going to take this in just a little bit different direction than maybe you think. One of the things that Jesus did in the Sermon on the Mount was he took the Old Testament law, which so many of the religious leaders of his day had mastered and thought that because they had found ways to manipulate that law to make them look good, that they were okay. Uh, but Jesus pulled the mask off of the actors and actresses, and he pointed to the heart. What is the heart behind that? So as we consider uh, this commandment today about not murdering, we're going to look at the principle behind life. Uh, we're going to look at what God meant by that in the Old Testament, but then we're going to spend the majority of our time today looking at how Jesus digs down into the kind of heart that given the opportunity, and if all the restraints were removed, would commit murder possibly. And you say, well, that's not me. I would never murder anybody. Again, stick around because Jesus is going to challenge our attitudes and our actions today. And I think we need to hear this one. Okay, so stick with me. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, and then we'll dig into our scripture. Heavenly Father, your word is precious because you are precious. You are holy and you are right. Uh, everything about you is right. Righteousness comes from you, and there is no righteousness apart from you. And you've displayed your righteousness in your precious word. So we come to it today humbly, but we come to this word today expectantly. I pray for the help of your Holy Spirit, uh, that you would give me the Spirit to teach this in a way that will edify the body of Christ, that will cause us to, to see the, the image of God in others and to value the lives of those around us, because we value you. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, let's dig into our scriptures. Here we are in our scripture. The commandment that we're going to look at today can be found in Exodus chapter 20 and verse 13. It's interesting in Hebrew, it's only two words and literally would say no murder. Uh, but as we translate it, it's you shall not murder. And it's a word murder that specifically applies to humans taking human life. A lot of times this has been taken out of context uh, in support of vegetarianism, uh, but it doesn't deal with taking the lives of animals. Uh, it, is, it is specifically addressed taking the life of human beings. Uh, it's not a call to um, pacifism and saying we should never go to war or that we shouldn't have the death penalty. Those are all discussions we could have at another time, but they really don't arrive from this commandment. The principle that we get behind this, you see written there at the top of the page, uh, that what we learn about God is because we are created in God's image, human life is precious. Let me kind of illustrate it this way. Um, if you are American, as I imagine 99.9% .9 of the people who will be watching this video are, um, you have an appreciation, I hope, for the American flag. Now, you understand that that American flag, and there's not one American flag. There are American flags over in every post office, at every school, in every government building. You may have one at your home. There are flags of the United States of America everywhere. And while they are not in and of themselves the, the nation, they are a visible representation of our country. And therefore, when we stand and we uh, put our hand over our heart, we pledge allegiance to the flag. We're not pledging allegiance to a piece of cloth. We are pledging allegiance to a country. 
to uh, fellow country men and women, uh, to principles and values, to the law, all that make up our country. The, the flag is the image, the representation of our country. And how you treat the flag then is how you treat the country. By the same token, if someone disrespects the flag, uh, we take that to mean they are disrespecting not a piece of cloth. They are disrespecting what the flag stands for. They are they are desecrating the image of something that the image represents. And we need to understand that as believers and as human, all of us as human beings, because we've been created in God's image, even though that image is marred, even though a person may not even be a Jesus follower, they may be antagonistic toward God and hate God, their very presence within them as marred and as fallen as it may be, somewhere hidden in there is the image of God. Because humankind represents the image of God. And so how we treat human life is precious. Now, this is not a prohibition, as I said, against all murder. Uh, in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, the Bible even says where e there's a time a season for everything and a time for every matter. You see in verse three, there's a time to kill and a time to heal. Now you read through the Old Testament, for instance, in Exodus 21, um, uh, there's a list of capital offenses, uh, things that you are liable to death for. Uh, and that carries over in Exodus 22. Uh, in Deuteronomy chapter 20, God commanded his people, when they entered the promised land, to totally annihilate the inhabitants of Canaan. All the, the Hivites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, all those ites. God said not to leave a one of them, even the human beings, to kill them. In fact, uh, there were some that they didn't obliterate. And as you read the end of the book of Joshua, and you read into Judges, and you read in um, Samuel Kings and Chronicles, those that they left behind caused them great trouble. But God said, kill them all. So there was a time to kill. Um, God specifically told Saul to annihilate the Amalekites. And uh, we won't go into all the reasons for that. You can, you can read that story in 1 Samuel 15, but Saul didn't do it. He kept, he kept behind some of the livestock and he spared the king of the Amalekites. And when Samuel confronted him with it, he tried to blame it on the other people. And Samuel basically said, well, you've disobeyed God. He said to get rid of everything. And because you've disobeyed God, uh, you're no longer going to be king. You've disqualified yourself from being king. God is going to take the throne from you. So, you know, very seriously, uh, we understand that there, there, God does see there is a time for killing to take place. And so there are a lot of ways we could look at this. We could talk about the issue of abortion, and that's a very important issue that we should talk about. Uh, take The taking of unborn life uh, is, is just an absolute blight uh, on our culture, that we have so little regard for life in the womb that we treat it as though it's, uh, we, are, we are keeping someone from being inconvenienced by taking the life uh, in, in a womb, and that's Certainly, uh, God would would this would fall under murder, and in and, and, uh, Exodus twenty one, that's one of the capital offenses. If you cause the the death of a, of an unborn child in a pregnant woman's womb, then you're liable for death. We could talk about the senseless killing that goes on now in our culture, the the murder culture that we have on the streets of our towns and our villages, and just how much killing takes place, senseless killing, and how we just as a culture, we have so little regard for life. We've, we have lost the truth that every person we look at is a reflection, whether it be a poor reflection or a good reflection, there is the image, the seed of the image of God inside of them. And therefore we need to treat, if we can't treat an individual with respect, we at least need to treat human life respectable and recognize that it is to be respected above all others. Uh, and we do that because, because we recognize we're created in God's image. 
Uh, God said, let us make man in our own image after our likeness. We recognize that life is a precious gift. God breathed into man's nostrils and he became a living soul. He didn't do that for any other creation. Life was a gift that came from God. And the life that I live, every day that I wake up, that is God's gift to me. And nobody has a right to steal God's gift from me. And I, I don't have a right to steal God's gift from someone else. So we recognize that. We, we recognize that, that ultimately life and death is in God's hands. After all the tragedy that happened to Job, he said, naked I came from my mother's womb, naked I'll return. The Lord is given, the Lord is taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Life is his to decide what to do with. So a lot of ways that we could go with this, a lot of issues that we could talk about. Uh, but we get back to the point that life, every human life deserves dignity and respect because it is in the image of God. And so I want you to keep in mind that image of the, the flag being the image of our country and the, the, the correlation to that, that we are in a sense flags of God, that we are the image of God. We, we represent God's plan, God's purpose. God created us for his glory. And so when you look at human beings, we, we represent the whole reason God created everything and what God has revealed in himself. And so that's important. So I want us to take that kind of to a, to where Jesus took it, because this was a very unique thing in the new Testament, uh, in the specifically in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus kind of gave his kingdom manifesto. What he was creating in this kingdom of heaven, as Matthew called it. Um, what he was doing in the hearts and lives of those who would follow him, the kind of people that we would be and that through his Holy Spirit, he would transform us to be. This is what life in his kingdom would, would look like. Not just in the future when... Armageddon happened, and he, but even now, as we recognize that he is King Jesus and that we live in his kingdom, and he is our king and we are his servants, we live to obey him. A lot of times what he would do is he would take an Old Testament law. You have heard that it was said, don't do this. For instance, you've heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say, if you look at a woman and lust after her, you've already broken that commandment, the heart behind that commandment, because you've already, at least in your heart, been unfaithful to your wife. Jesus also did that with this commandment, the commandment about murder. So I want us to take a few minutes and kind of look at this and just, I want us to think very soberly about our attitudes toward other people, all right? Jesus said, you've heard that it was said of those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you, whoever is, and notice what he does, he gives us three things. Whoever is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. And whoever says, you fool." will be liable to the hell of fire. Notice the progression, angry to insulting, to just totally calling somebody a fool. Let's break this down for just a minute. The first attitude that Jesus deals with, deals with is the attitude of anger. Whoever is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Who else was liable to judgment? Whoever murdered. So if the murderer is liable to judgment. And the angry person is liable to judgment, then we could deduce that in God's eyes, anger is just as serious as murder. Why? Granted, it's not taking of life, but it's the attitude about the other person that my life is more important than theirs and that I'm right and they're wrong. You see, with anger, there is 
there is inherent with every angry attitude a spirit of entitlement. Because if I'm angry at something, I'm angry because it did not agree with me. Uh, it did not measure up to my standard. It wasn't what I said it should be. It went against my will or my desire. I think things ought to be this way. And I'm angry because they aren't this way. Well, the problem is it sets I on the throne. And that's never the right place. Jesus is on the throne. And I am below the throne. But when I'm angry at a brother in Christ because they disagree with me, then I'm saying, I don't care about the image of God in you. I don't care that you bear the image of God as much. And I'm not saying we should never disagree. I'm just saying we should never be disagreeable in our disagreements. And I never have the right, and it is never appropriate for me to express anger at someone who equally bears the image of God to me. I stand just in need of God's grace as the person I'm tempted to be angry at. So he says, whoever is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Then he says, whoever insults his brother. And this is the idea of contempt. So we have gone now from an attitude to words, from attitude to words. Literally, when uh, Jesus said, whoever insults, uh, it literally says, whoever says raka. Raka was an Aramaic word that meant a person was a, a nitwit. Uh, a person was without any mental capabilities um, or the word we're not supposed to use anymore. That person is stupid. And so it's, it's going from having an attitude of anger to expressing that anger. So insult is an expression of anger. It's not recognizing the anger and speaking angrily toward a person. And then it goes to a third level when it says, whoever says, you fool. So you've gone from this seething anger to talking bad about something, now what you've done, you've gone from attitude to words to judgment. The word here for fool is where we get our word for moron. It's, it's a, it's a, you may think I'm being mean using that word. That's the Greek word moron. And it means to be without moral sense. So here's the progression. You go from being upset that somebody doesn't see it the way you see it. And then you use your words, you call them names. And then after you call them names, you make a value judgment on them and say, they are worthless. Well, here's the problem with that. Do I call worthless someone who bears God's image? I placed myself above God. Now, let me just kind of close out by making all of this practical. We live in a very polarized society. We're polarized by politics. We're polarized by worldview. Uh, we're polarized by preferences, even within the religion 
religious world, even within the Christian world, even within the church, even within the Baptist church. And we have a tendency, if we're not careful, to look at others who don't see it the way we see it and think that we have a right to be angry with them just because they don't not. And I'm not talking about going against scripture. Scripture is scripture. The word of God is true. We uphold the word of God. We're not judging when we say something is not measuring up to God's standard. Here's the difference. Jesus is not talking about holding up somebody to God's standard. When Jesus talks about going from anger to contempt to, to judgmentalism, he's talking about then using our standards instead of his. And here's the circle of all of this. Jesus started it out by saying, you've heard it said, you shall not murder, but I say to you this. Jesus recognized the same attitude, the same disregard for the image of God in a person that would lead a person to uselessly take that life is the same disregard for the image of God that I would have if I'm going to be angry at a brother in Christ. Now, here's what Jesus said about that. This is what I'll close with. We didn't keep this in there, and I, 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 maybe I should have. But I want you to go back and read in Matthew 5, verses 23 through 26. Well, I'm really serious about this. I want to encourage you to do this. I want you to search your heart. Jesus said, so if you bring your gift to the altar, and there you remember that you've done one of those three things. You've been angry. You've been content, you've been contemptuous, or you've been judgmental toward a brother. Don't leave, don't even come here and worship until you go make it right with your brother. Folks, we need to stop the name calling. We need to stop making fun of others. We need to stop considering others less than us and ourselves better than somebody else because we think we have the moral high ground. We don't have the only one who has the moral high ground is Jesus. We are equal at the foot of the cross. We are equally in need of grace. I don't want to be guilty of having the same kind of heart that left unchecked would commit murder. That but that instead murders someone's reputation or murders someone's value, at least in my own mind, in my own estimation, in my own eyes. I want to do what Paul said and to esteem others as more important than myself. That's the way of Christ. So I hope this is an encouragement, but I hope it's a challenge. I want you to think about relationships. Maybe there's some people you need to go to and apologize. Maybe there's some accounts you need to set straight. Because week after week, Christians sit in churches, cross and at odds with people in the same room with them. And they sing, oh, how I love Jesus. And they talk about how much they love God and serve God. And they think how great they are in God's eyes. When in God's eyes, they're just as bad as a murderer because of their attitude, because of others. Let's ask God to reveal to us, you know, kind of what my prayer is, what the Apostle John said in Revelation, let he who has an ear hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. May God use this and speak to you in whatever way he sees fit. Even when there are hard messages like this, I want you to know I love you. I do this because I love you. I want you to walk in all the fullness that Christ has for you. Uh, I, I want him to do his work completely in your life, his work of sanctification. I want him to use me sometimes if necessary to even point out areas that he wants to deal with. And he's, he's defeated all of this on the cross. He's taken care of all of this. You have the power to overcome this through him. He has the power to overcome it. And I pray that he will in your life. God bless you. Look forward to seeing you next time.